Okay, so. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So today I want to talk about a couple things Jer threw out yesterday. I uh, really liked that. Um, we are a growing creative team. We're very busy. You are a two-man animation duo. And yet most of the things we do that you guys touch actually doesn't get to see the light of day a lot of times. Um, being a creative person that wants to have your work seen, do you guys ever uh, do you ever find yourself like not being motivated in the work in the in the long drought of season of doing the thing without getting it out there into the world? Does that ever affect you? Are you motivated by getting people to people seeing your work and and? Yeah, I mean, I think that'd be awesome because even like when I started <laughs> animating, that was. <laughs> I think that would be awesome. Yeah, I mean, but like when I started animating, that was like the thing I looked forward to when I would make a piece and then upload it to YouTube and share it to Facebook and have everybody comment on it and say how much they like it. But that was like earlier on. So I guess I've kind of gotten used to not being able to do that and just being okay with I created something. I know I created that. My wife can see it and that that's good enough. Is she proud of you? Oh, yeah, she's very proud of me. She tells me. What about you, Jerry? Yeah. Uh, so I guess to build a little context around this question, um, a lot of the projects we do and like the nature of animation um, can take several forms in terms of like the final thing that we make. So um, we've been working with big companies who have us create an animated financial report so that people aren't just uh, <laughs> sitting through a boring <laughs> presentation with... Uh, someone just delivering numbers at him monotone. Just kidding, so, Megan. Yeah, just kidding, JK. Um, but uh, no, I mean, th those things, we get handed sometimes a lot of boring, confidential content, and it's our job to make it enjoyable to watch. And, and as such, uh, a lot of those projects never see the light of day, uh, which is practically the opposite, I'm pretty sure, from the video team, where it'd be very rare that we can't show or share a project the video team puts out, but it doesn't mean uh, you know that we're working any less hard or trying to put as much creative love into that thing as we can. Um, but uh, it it does kind of it, it is a little bit of a setback to not be able to put stuff out. But you uh, you started doing something I thought was really cool um, in the last I think six months or eight months is where you were doing a lot of little illustration frames or um, Cinema 4D renders. Mm -hmm. um, was that was that a direct result of that? Kind of just, would you say? Yeah, yeah, there's probably some of that where you get that little hit of dopamine every time you get a like <laughs> via a social media platform, which is undeniable. It just is what it is. But uh, in addition to that, too, some of those projects are boxed in pretty tightly by like brand guidelines or how much fun or how expressive you can be with what you're doing. So, um, I think, and, and to be honest too, um, sometimes they're just not very challenging creatively or they, they don't really push you to new artistic, uh, horizons, I guess. So for me putting out those frames and trying to learn more about cinema, was about being able to put something out, let people know, hey, I'm still making art, but also learn something new and push myself. So, so um, I do want to talk a little bit about the transition because um, I think you and I have a interesting like relationship and how you started. Well, how you started actually getting an animation at all, but then how you came on here. And uh, for people that don't know, Jeremy and I were buds, and uh, I had we had started Rhino. And then Jer was working a different job, but he was displaying a lot of talent, making videos and learning animation through video co-pilot tutorials. And um, you said to me that you were going to build an arcade machine. And I remember just being like flabbergasted at what a waste of time that would be with how talented you are. <laughs> and I, I don't know how many conversations we had around it, but we've talked about how I was just like, dude, are you kidding me? Like why would you waste your time making an arcade machine? You have so much talent. And then there's this like series of conversations about me trying to convince you to quit your safe job and come work here and all that. Um, but like, how's it, how's it feel now? Cause that feels like even saying that out loud feels 
so long ago to me, like so another planet, you know? Yeah. With like how Luke Skywalker Jedi level you are now. Um, yeah. So can you go back in your head at all about like being scared to make a jump and like take on a, take on a job like that? Yeah. Um, well, so the arcade cabinet conversation is, is a really, was probably a very pivotal point in my life. I would say like a pretty pivotal awakening for me, uh, as I guess as common of a little critique or challenge as that might have sounded from you, uh, it was also really validating to me to think that anyone in the world thought that I'd be wasting my time doing something because I could use it for something to better myself. I don't. I, I didn't really have a ton of like hard affirmation in my life like that. So um, I think it uh, it just it just got me. It, it just gave me enough belief. I, I think honestly. Um, Shortly thereafter is where the Michigan bottle opener <laughs> started being drawn out and sketched out and concepted. Um, and, and it's all interconnected into, you know, the confidence and the faith I needed in myself to take the plunge to come on to Rhino, uh, where, I mean, when you, when you decide to join a team, I think that is still very new and relatively unproven, but exciting and there's cool things going on, but you know, for a fact that you're going to be personally called on to contribute and that you're, uh, you're going to kind of just have to expose your weaknesses and your strengths to the world all at the same time. And that's a pretty terrifying prospect if you don't believe in yourself, let alone the fact that this is art we're creating, which is like exposing and vulnerable all in its own way too. It's like, if if someone doesn't like my art, they don't like me. And that's one of the first big obstacles I think you have to really wrestle with as a creative professional. But, uh, I think it, 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 it's crazy to look back and see that person because so much has happened since then. And like so much change and so much growth. I know just from, just from being thrown into the pit of like being paid to make art. Yep. Yeah. Saying it out loud, I felt weird. I was like, this doesn't feel at all like the same Jeremy. And you know, and I know it's not, but it just, it was like, it's crazy to see the transformation in even like, I don't know, whatever that was, seven years ago or something. It was pretty wild. What is it like for you? Because you, because you did uh, motion graphics just as a fun like activity. You kind of yeah. mostly self taught, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You did go to Kendall. Yeah, for like one year. But we won't talk about how you feel no, about it. We don't have to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> We're big Western Michigan University fans around here yeah. at Rhino, Kalamazoo, Michigan. So anyway, um, so you got into doing motion graphic videos like in high school and all that, right? Mm-hmm. Did you did you ever see yourself like doing it as a career or was it just always a hobby? Honestly, like around like in high school, I never thought of it, thought that it would ever be a career because at that time, I don't know, my parents just wanted me to just be like be a nurse and just go to school for that. So I was just like, this is just something fun I'm just doing. And when I go to college, I'm probably just going to put on the side and focus on studying. But it was just something I had a passion for and I just kept it up. I just kept learning. I kept growing in it in it. And yeah, all this I yeah, I never saw saw this coming or planned for it. So for anyone who's watching this and doesn't know, you're from Nigeria originally. Yep. Your family's moved here when you were how old? Um when I was six years old, so the year two thousand. Okay. Yeah. But they're pretty like old school in some ways. Yeah. And talk to me about how they value education and like your upbringing and how they kind of yeah. raise you and stuff. Um, so like we came here, we came here in the year 2000. Um, my mom first came here by herself. She, uh, won the visa lottery when they were doing that. And so she came here by herself for like, she stayed for a whole year just working and trying to, I think it was like, she had to prove to the government that if the whole family came, we wouldn't be a liability. So she did that for a whole year. Then we were able to come. And, uh, when we came, it's like, my dad had a degree from Nigeria, but it's like, it didn't do anything here. So he was like a taxi driver, and then he went to school to get like a computer science degree, and then that didn't work out. And then I think it was around like 2010 or something 
that's when he started going to Western and then he got his bachelor's for nursing. And it was like after that, that's when things just started to like change for us financially. And then he later on went on to get his master's and then he's working on his PhD. So like for them, he came, literally came from like poverty to making a life for himself here. So in their minds, they see education as this is the only way you can make it in America. This is how we did it. If, we, if your dad didn't get the education, we would not be where we are. And so they don't... Which is true. Yeah. Yeah, it's you true. Can, I mean, it's what worked for them. And yep. um, in their minds, they don't see it as like, this is 2018. There are so many other ways you can go to be successful in America. And so, um, I don't know where to, where should well, I? Well, well, you, you were going to school, yeah. you went to Cal or you went to Kendall yep. and, but you weren't going for, you weren't going for a, a, um, a career that traditionally requires a degree, yeah. uh, for that gatekeeper, uh, level of entry. Mm-hmm. So you don't, you know, you're not going to be a nurse, you're not going to be, uh, you know, in the medical field or whatever yeah. that they're familiar with, you're going into creative field. Mm-hmm. And so when you decided you weren't going to finish college yeah. and you got a job here, yeah. that ruffled their feathers. Yeah. And I mean, the thing my mom constantly said was that like, you need a bachelor's degree as a safety net. If for some reason this job you're going for doesn't work, what are you going to fall on? You're not going to be able to ever get a job anywhere because you don't have a degree. And that's where a big fear of hers came from. But like, how I see it is that, yeah, I don't have a bachelor's degree, but I have this large amount of knowledge for animation to the point where it's like, this is my bachelor's. My portfolio is my bachelor's degree. But to them, it's like, they're so old school that they, they see it as you need a degree. That's it. Your dad had a gr- degree, his life changed. And that's the only way we see that, like, you can make it here. Even even before I went to Kendall, like I had to convince them for like a whole week, just staying up. <laughs> I remember just staying up until like four o'clock for like. Th- um, I remember just like staying up until four o'clock for like three nights, trying to show them facts that like, hey, if I go into animation, these are the kind of stuff I could do. That animation is not just some dumb job that you can get you can get anywhere. I'm like, you guys watch TV all the time. You see that? That's motion graphics. That's the kind of stuff I'll be doing. So I had to just prove to them that like animation is a legitimate job, and that that took a while. But then, yeah, me choosing not to finish Kendall and going a different route that just that ruffled a lot of feathers. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the thing I think is interesting too, and I don't know your parents have never met them, mm-hmm. know you well, but like, I. The thing I'd want to say too is like, look, it's true. Your portfolio is your degree in some sense. It's the thing that proves your viability. Yeah. And I, I, I don't live and, and work in, in uh, Hollywood or, you know, other hotbed where I'm sure a lot of people seek out jobs like that. We obviously live in Kalamazoo and there's a value in it that we can create at Rhino mm-hmm. and what we can produce for our clients. But I guess what I'm trying to say is, <clears throat> I have a hard time thinking that any studio or any agency wouldn't look at a, an awesome, diverse portfolio of like fantastic work and a certain set of competencies and, a, and staying relevant and knowing the proper tools and relevant, modern, recent work experiences. And I, I don't know, it just seems ridiculous yeah. that especially in the, I don't know. I've never cared. I have a degree from from Western in, in uh, management, but like, I've never once thought about that as a thing that I need to get anywhere. Once you start going in the creative realm, mm-hmm. I don't think about that ever. Yeah. You know, it's not. It's rarely only like twice in an RFP has it. It's been like you know who's your leadership and what is their experience and what school did they go to. That's been asked like twice. You know, we'll we'll write a proposal for. Tons and tons of tens and tens of thousands of dollars, and they don't ever ask you. One of those was a government entity, right? Were they both? Yeah, probably. (laughs) Probably, yeah, if I remember right. Um, yeah, it's just so. I mean, hopefully, hopefully, your parents come around. Yeah, I, I do think that. I mean, the reality is, if you do, like, let's say for some reason, robots take over and there is no more animation jobs because robots do all the animating or whatever. Like we all talk about the impending robot apocalypse. 
you can always restart. You can always go back to college if you really had to. Like I think for your parents, they think they probably just think you're giving up on the idea of education, yeah. and that's not true at all. Like you're yeah. you you're a continual learner, and like I just think that some yeah. of that stuff just might be family tension. And, and honestly, you know. like how I see it is that you can you can go to school for four years and put in all that time and effort to get your degree. Or you could put in the same amount of time and effort to like learning a skill and even doing it that way, you can still come out better than the person who chose to go to school. And I've been doing animation since like I was in 10th grade, 2010. And I I feel like I've put in more time and like effort and learning than people who decide, yeah, after college, I want to do this. Yeah. So, yeah, if, if I can insert here too, that that quality is I think the big game changer if anyone's listening and they are on the beginning of you know starting a creative career in any kind of capacity um, as someone who sits across the table from a lot of different people coming in wanting to be a part of our team from you know a wide diversity of backgrounds the single like trump card for my Don't being interested the in them, the, the single biggest factor that it, it just sets them apart from their peers is, are you the kind of person who's going to crack open a tutorial and like be doing that almost every night? Like if you're single and you have time and you're doing that every night, you're going to come in and outshine someone who just wrapped up their bachelor's degree at Kendall for motion design for because... Sure. And not to say that you can't go to college and be doing that at the same time and be equally competitive, but in my mind, you're only equally competitive. It doesn't matter to me that you know you uh, have a degree. It, 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 the portfolio is everything. And then also with Shun, something that was very validating was his uh, engagement with the tutorial culture on YouTube with After Effects. He was putting up his own tutorials, which meant... He was like watching a ton of them himself. So, and I think to speak to that, you've pretty much came in a lot of Saturdays because your wife works a yeah. job on Saturday. So you just come in. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do? I mean, are you doing tutorials? You do extra, like, just I, what are you doing? Well, I didn't always do it. I, th I think it's been like the last eight months that I started doing that. And I kind of reached a point where I was like, usually I would spend my Saturdays playing video games. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> but I reached a point like a couple months ago where I was just like, this is not doing anything for my future. I could be like, I could be better in myself and adding more to like where I want to be by coming in and spending my Saturday doing this. So I just come in sometimes, I will watch a Cinema 4D tutorial or um, this last couple of weeks, I've just been working on like a personal project and I have a couple of those that I want to do this year just a way just to stay creative and keep doing stuff but yeah i've just kind of come to a conclusion that like playing video games is all right but i don't want to waste my saturdays doing that when i could be doing something so much better with my time yeah. yeah and in animation specifically there is so much always changing and improving and new plugins and new tools being added to the software packages that yeah if you're not staying diligent to keep up on those things you're just missing out on abilities to improve your workflow but then also uh it's it's crazy to me to think that the the, fir the first official 3d project we took on mm -hmm. is for big fortune 500 company and quite the challenge also to take a cloth item and wrap it around uh different parts of the human yeah. body which in 3d is incredibly difficult but when you're I think when you have that mindset that Shun has to uh, go at it and, and to know that there isn't a problem, a tutorial on YouTube can't help you get through in 3D, you're super equipped to take on anything yeah. that, that comes in. Yeah. That's one of the things I really like about animation too is that I've started to see it as just like a series of problems. It's like every step there's a problem and you just got to keep pushing forward till you reach the finish line. And it, it's like, okay, what is the fastest way to do this? Or what is the most efficient way to do this where I can go back and change something and I wouldn't have to scrap the entire thing? Or like, how can I combine these four tools to create this effect? 
and it's been it's been fun looking at it that way and it's it's been like a really good challenge nice yeah so i want to switch gears a little bit i, lo- I love what, what we're talking about but i want to talk a little bit about um one thing i think a lot of everyone at rhino and anyone doing creative work can connect with but the idea of your value is to be creative and, and to create new things and solve creative problems, we don't just hand you a set of instructions and a puzzle to put together. There's a lot of figuring out what this puzzle will look like and how it's going to move and, and so to speak. So I don't know about you guys, but I personally get extremely exhausted having to be creative all the time and that the value of my output is very contingent on my creative energy. How do you guys get through that do you ever i mean i know you do so it's kind of a silly question but do you guys ever feel like just super creatively drained and you don't have any creative mojo and if so what have you done in the past to help get around that or get over that i know particularly for you jer because right now you're like all over the place writing scripts talking with clients actually animating designing things sometimes project management like so i know this is a Something that you probably deal with. I don't know. If, I don't know if this hits you as much, soon. Yeah, I don't but think, I don't think it hits me as much as Jeremy. Do you want to talk about powerlifting instead? Yeah, let's talk about powerlifting. Uh, <laughs> I'm just joking. So, I can't talk about powerlifting. Yeah, so maybe we'll stick to the creative question. Yeah. Um, Do you get burnout ever? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. I mean, I mean, I I guess I don't. I guess I haven't been sitting across the room from someone who's certified to tell me you're burned out. <laughs> you never had a psychologist tell you. So, <laughs> um, so I, I know that I have felt like I can't even think right now. I kind of don't care. Uh, and you need both of those things to create. <laughs> you need to care and you need to be able to think. Um, so, uh, it's, it's definitely, uh, I guess, the plight of the creative professional, especially when you're not a freelancer and you don't get like, a, you know, two or three weeks off after you finish a project, it's like you, you wrap one brain melter and it's right into the next one after another. Um, but uh, funny enough, I just uh, finished reading a book I would highly recommend to any creative professional called The War of Art. And that has helped me at least shift my thinking from, man, it's exhausting to feel like I just have to sit here and wait for some serendipitous like connector in my brain to give me an idea to get my creating happening. Um, instead, that book recommends that you know there's this thing in us called the resistance um, that the the job of the creative professional is to always be beating resistance and to see your art as a professional and uh, there was a quote in the book and I'm gonna butcher it but it was something to the effect of uh, I don't know when inspiration will strike but I know it always happens between nine and five so the idea is like you sit down like a professional and you 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 create this uh, block of time for you to do what you need to do and as long as you're doing that every day you're gonna be fine and so far that's been true. Even, even before I came to that realization, if you come to work every day and, and you know you're not going to get beaten by resistance, you know you're not going to be pulled away into the other things, it, it's funny how important um, all of the unimportant things become when you have a really pressing creative deadline or like something you know you have to do. Like I'll go and start doing chores I hate or I'll go and start like checking my bank account or something because <laughs> it's... Do I have any money anymore? Yeah, it's, it's not nearly as intimidating. <laughs> Do that all the time. Like, are, do I have taxes I can work on right now? <coughs> you'll, you'll take anything. Uh, but can someone come pull my teeth? But to just sit down and wage war with like that idea and, and just keep going on it until you get that breakthrough and you make it happen. Uh, doing that like it's a nine to five, as soul sucking as that might sound, is the only yeah. way I think to have a sustainable like output. Yeah. Well, I think we tried to format, we've, we've talked about this a lot at Rhino where, uh, a lot of times creative work, some people might fancy themselves more night owl creatives. And we try to give you some flexibility for that and your schedule. But for the most part, for us to be a team, we kind of have to exhibit or inhabit the same space and time at, at, um, 
to to feel cohesion. And so we do kind of work like a nine to five schedule here with some flexibility. You know, we kind of always say like if you if you're out late or whatever, it's okay if you come in a little late or whatever, um, or if you just need to get out for the day and go work somewhere else or or. Honestly, I don't think I don't feel like people take me up on this much, but I always say like if you want to work late or go, you know, if you if you think like, hey, I want to work a four hour chunk of creative time tonight, I don't mind if you leave early, you know, as long as you're gonna have some output. If someone was doing that all the time and not having anything to show for it, I probably would, I'd question how that's actually going down. But um, it it is it's tricky because. Um, I think there's a value in the team and the connection. I think that was like my whole thing with Rhino is um, I love doing creative work. I, lo- I actually, back in the day, I used to be up till 2 a.m. every night. Just, you know, you guys have all been there. Like yeah. before you had a, a job, quote unquote, to be there in the morning, it's like it just feels good to be up late and trolling yeah. around on the internet. Not trolling, but, you know, <laughs> not trolling at all, actually. I don't like, I'm not like that. But like being up late, listening to new music, reading some article, like just growing your mind and learning. And, and, um, I don't know what I used to do back then. AOL instant messenger or something. I don't know, but yeah. And I would like write songs. That was a big like period of songwriting for me actually. Um, but now I have a wife and two kids and I can't do that. So I've got to be able to do the work in a scheduled time of day. And I think like, uh, and even being able to depend on it early on in Rhino's, um, in uh, Rhino's history, one of my business mentors, like really pushed for, you know, you've got, you guys have got to get to a spot where you can get a steady paycheck. Um, you can't just go like, just pay yourselves on projects. I don't care if it's even like a smaller amount than you kind of need. You need to have something you can count on to start developing some sort of lifestyle and habit and pattern. And then you can work on growing that, but you got to create some solid thing. Um, because in the past it would be like I'd do a photo shoot and I'd just pay myself some ex- some percentage of that shoot, and if Dan edited a video, it'd be some percentage of that video he'd get. And it was like really, really all over the place, hard to keep track of. And so, um, but that consistency, I feel like, and maybe this is too like a Midwestern thing, but I feel like here in the Midwest, we get married and we have kids. Like my friend Ray Lee from New York City, when she came out to my wedding. She was like, I've never been to a wedding. And she's the same age as me. And she said, this is just weird. We don't do this in New York City. No one gets married. And uh, and out here in the Midwest, like we we're, we have like kind of more Midwest values. Like you find a girl or, you know, you get married and you, you have a family and like you do that. And to make a family work, you need consistency and you need to be a good husband or a good wife when you come home. You need to be a good member of society, like in other ways. So you can't just kill yourself all the time or, you know, um, I just feel like I believe it's better for the person as a, as a human being to have consistency and be disciplined in their day to day than just like have a, a bunch of, you know, people who are, uh, you know, maybe, you know, so many people that are in creative, it's kind of like comedians, they get into like drinking a lot or they do drugs they're like you know it's like that you you need creative fulfillment from something and so you need that energy source and i don't know i I, i've never worked in the creative industry frankly in like a big city but i can't help but feel like you know you hear about like men abusing women or you know in the hollywood industry or um, people just having like really being taken advantage of in their job and i just never wanted to do that so creating some of those structures i think is just part and parcel of it I don't know, but it is tricky. Um, one thought, one one topic that you threw out there, I thought would be really good. We got about ten minutes too. Um, what's it? Talk about the challenge of working with your friends. Do you do you have any like just thoughts ready to share on that? Hmm. Um, yeah, this was my idea, but I don't. I can kick um, it off. I'm trying to think of a good uh, starting point. Um, I mean, we don't talk about it either. Well, no, it, it, it'd be good too. I think aside from the, uh, it, it's awesome first and foremost. I mean, to be able to share more life and, and to, to be able to spend every day with people who are, you know, have, have the same kinds of passions and, uh, and, and to be able to win with those people too is, is a thrill. And it's, it's really cool to get to share that, uh, 
with people you already decided to be friends with uh, before all that. Um, and at Rhino, a lot of people come in and often become fast friends uh, just because of who we decide to hire and the awesome culture we have and all that. Um, Kevin and I are best buds and... Uh, I'm Kevin. And he, this is Kevin. Um, and uh, there's definitely been times where, you know... I've driven him nuts. I've he's, never driven you nuts. He's driven me nuts. <laughs> and uh, I think, uh, um, I mean. How have we gotten through that? Well, yeah, the, it, it's been, there's, there's nothing I don't think that can replace just being committed to getting together and talking about that stuff because it is bound to happen. Like, I don't want to be too dramatic in saying that running a business is uh sometimes it can kind of feel like a small scale war or like there's like some strategy that you're plotting out and it certainly gets stressful and you know you're trying to you're trying to lead something and you're trying to grow it and you're competing and like your your artists like vulnerability thing and even like some personal ego and pride issues like it all it, it can be very very stressful and so then in that stressful environment tempers can flare and things can be mis misstated or misunderstood and uh i would say most of the time when we've had a conflict it's usually been something was misunderstood more than more than not or we just needed to clarify uh some kind of overreach and there's been times too where i've just been a straight jerk and needed some correction. Well, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think in the, that was a really sloppy answer. Sorry, crash on. No, I thought it was good. So I think that uh, with with uh, so I always feel like what Rhino does and what we have to do in our job is really walk this line of art and execution of the deliverable for a client. So we're really you, we are very much so participating in an artistic endeavor. But at the same time, if it was truly art, no one would tell you how to make it. It's your art. There's no one to please. And that's why artists sometimes get that reputation of being really hard to work with or, um, you know, obstinate or just arrogant, whatever word you want to associate that. Like even like fine artists can be known as or eccentric or weird, or whatever, because they are 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 in this war against themselves to create something that speaks for their like soul or passion or some view they hold or or whatever they want to make someone feel like but it's up to them as how it comes out and that's it and at rhino we're doing things that we're being paid to make for a client so you're pushing as far as you can into that artistic endeavor of making something unique and interesting and compelling um on some level and so there's a client that you have to kind of work with to to erode away at your artistic vision. And I don't mean that like clients, you know, ruin artistic vision, but it's just what it is. You're compromising your vision to make both sides happy. And the same thing happens with, you know, having like someone on your team who might have some say over the thing that you don't or um, maybe an insight you don't even have or whatever, whoever's like leading the project. Um, and I know we've argued about that time where you said like, well, it just kind of sucks because you have carte blanche over everything around here sometimes. This is like three or four years ago when you're arguing about that Dark Horse animation. And I said, I just did like the green sauce around that logo is too bloopy. And you're like, I think it's fine. And I'm like, I, I don't know. And I I don't know. We, we got to, obviously we got over that. Um, but I'm for, not over it. <laughs> for whatever reason, that one always stands out because we were just at an impasse. I'm like, I think it's a little over the top. You're like, I think it's just right. I'm like, well, I don't know because here's, and, and the thing I said at the time, and I'm not saying I'm right, but it's like a thought that I really crystallized for me is like, listen, I have to go to the client and give them this. And if I don't get it or like it, then it kind of makes me a weak, impotent person because I'm saying, well, my animator made this. Do you like it? I don't even really like it, but do you like it? It puts me in a really weird spot. So I kind of have to believe in the thing and that's why I think like we always have to be selling each other on things too. And that's why I push people to like, if you make something and you think it's great, I've got to believe that it's great too. So you got to convince me. You can't just go like, here you go. Because that next level is they have to take what you made 
and their audience has to like it. Exactly. And if there's like, like that's why you need cohesion all along the line. And I don't have to like it at first, but I, I'm, I'd like to think this is one of my better qualities. I'm always open to the debate and please convince yeah. me it's good. I'm, it might take a minute or it might take an hour or a day or two, but let's talk about it and let's, let's get there. Because if I don't like the thing that my company Rhino's name is on and I'm the one physically inter- interacting with the client, I don't have anything. I have nothing. Like, you know, and it's not even like, it's not even like smoke and mirrors mirage. It's just literally like, how can I give something to a client that I don't think is the best thing for them? It doesn't make any sense, you know? So that was actually a really good realization for me because I couldn't, I didn't have that going into that one conversation. I just thought, I don't know why this matters so much, but I just, ha- I do have to think this is right. Or the, and then I came to that realization. Um, I think that's a really important skill too. There's something to take out of that where uh, if you're not able to articulate why you did something or why something is good, like if if you're sending over the first draft of something and in your email, you're not calling out why it's great, brace for a revision. Yep. Because you have the ability in that first look to craft someone's perception of what you've done and you obviously shouldn't be using that in a manipulative or you you should be doing work that delivers on their objectives. And that is very well done and to your best ability. But then if, if you really want to avoid unnecessary revision or doubt in their mind, tell them why it's good. And and that probably translates to not just, you know, the types of creative work we do, but I'm sure uh, it's kind of almost like, that's what marketing is. Tell someone why this is good. Yeah. You know. And and in the end, the end thing has to kind of live on its own in the market too. But in the creative process, it we talk about it being like a little protected baby. Like you have to carefully handle the baby. And then when it's ready to be born and go out into the world, then it should kind of live on its own. The analogy kind of falls apart at that point. But the the point is when it's still in formulation, you gotta talk about it a certain way and but when it comes out, it needs to stand on its own two feet. Um, but I think, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I had a thought that I lost for a second there. I think uh, it's also where, where we can provide more value to our customers too. Be- because we're, we're the creative professionals that they're hiring to help create their thing. And we, we also have to kind of defend it against some false assumptions they might have about well, why'd you make this decision? Well, here's why I did. Yep. And, and they might not know that. So it's not like you're entering into an argument with them. You're, you're providing your professional opinion on why it's good, which is context they don't have. Yep. And you're just providing that much. Because if we took every single cue from our customers as gospel and just ran with it, yep. the, the end product would suffer because that's not what they do. That's what we do. Yep. But you also, always, you know, you, you got to balance that with like being reasonable and working with them and not just... Uh, championing your own ideas all the way through. I think that's like the secret sauce that we have done so well over the years. And I think if we can find a better way to art- or continue to develop how we articulate that, it'll only help us as a company. Cause I really think that's been one of the key things that we're good at is like what you just said about a client. I actually just had a conversation with a guy over civil house who's a designer and he was saying he does do work sometimes where the client just tells him exactly what to do. And then that it's done. And I, you know, and I get it because we've we've been there too, growing up and yep. getting into the industry. But that's not the type of work anyone wants to do. And we get a lot of clients that come to us that say, you know, you guys are experts. We want you to do your thing. And I know what they mean when they say that. They mean what we're talking about. And but we have to be willing to push back on their ideas or hear what we always say. And I think you did a really nice job with the script we just reviewed yesterday. Was like, I'm going to ingest everything you told me. I'm going to trust it. Not everything you're saying I'm going to do literal or the thing we just did. The animation uh, explainer for national flavors is a good example because the CEO of the company was like, well, let's have it start, have it feel like a story. So the beginning it's all sad and it's like in black and white and then it'll, it'll like turn into color. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's like the wizard of Oz effect. And we're not going to literally do that because that's, it's quite a cliched trope at this point. Like that's a, a TV infomercial that you'd watch at midnight and, for the Ginsu knife or whatever. So we don't like to do that in videos, but we're, but I always like, and this I think sometimes can be to my detriment. I'm always open to think about it as if it could happen. Mm -hmm. I go, maybe we could do that. Let's think about that. 
then usually through the vetting process and bouncing it off other Rhino team members, I actually, that's not a good idea. Here's a better idea. But I'm like always open to any idea. It's rare that I hear something go, that's not doing that, you know? Um, so, but going back to what we were saying, like you kind of always have to be selling your idea. You always have to be like, and even like I talk about this with, with uh, people in selling themselves, like you kind of constantly have to be convincing and negotiating with the world around you that you're a person worthy of time and value. And so like how you choose to dress, you're always sell. you you know, this is how I introduce this topic to people that don't understand what I'm saying. It's like the, the clothes you choose to wear are saying something about who you are. And when people get really hung up on, well, why do um, people treat me differently if I dress nice versus if I dress crummy? That's not fair. And it's like, it's absolutely fair. You're putting yourself out there in a certain way. You do it too. You don't realize it, but um, you you dress in the way that you want your your internal like soul identity to be manifested externally. And that really matters. And so same thing when you're handling a creative project, you need to always be talking about it in the way that you wish it to be seen. And even if you, if, even if it's current state, isn't doing that, you've got to talk about it as though we're getting it to its future state and let's get there together. And here's what still needs to happen. And you know, and all that stuff. So, um, I think that's a really key thing that the Rhino team members who get that, the faster you get that, the quicker you advance here. And I think you'd probably anywhere you go doing creative work, that's going to benefit you is knowing how to talk about something that's unformed and always selling yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I think something that's interesting too is how many people seem to take a deep breath once they've heard you think it's heading in a good direction. Yeah. Like, like that comfort of, oh, okay, this guy who does this all the time thinks this is going really well. Like, yeah. Yep. There's been a lot of situations where I think there's been some anxiety and then, you know, I say, man, I, I think our illustrator crushed this and they're like, oh, Awesome. Cool. Yeah, me too. I think so too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you look to the you look to the seasoned experienced like leaders who've done it before and you're like, "Do you like it?" Oh, yeah, we all like it too. Yeah. You know. And as you grow, you develop your own opinion, you become that seasoned leader professional. Um so last thought, real quick, last thought I want to get. I think this would be a fun tradition to start with the Rhino podcast. Jeremy, I want you to Tell Shun something that you love about him. Shun, tell Jeremy something you love about him. Or just give him some praise, man. Give him some verbal. Yeah. You can hold his hand if you want or look at him. It is blue shirt Shun, which is, is a little shirt. bit softer and gentler version of Shun. Yeah. It comes out like once every two weeks. I like it. Yeah. Shun, um, I love that uh, you want to earn your keep and that you're driven to contribute to our team and that it matters to you that, uh, you're helping Rhino grow. You guys don't have to, I mean, you guys are making this like a therapy session, which I like, but you don't have to make it. So, I mean, you can just talk in the mic and talk. That was beautiful. Though. I can't stare deeply into his beautiful blue shirt eyes. Yeah, you can. Okay. All right, Shun. Um, Jeremy, I, I really, <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> Sorry, okay. I can't help it. That's like how you have to do. It. All right, Jeremy. I really, I really appreciate your work ethic. Um, it is very, very inspiring, and just like your desire to always like create stuff and um, even think of new ideas and like be an entrepreneur. Like I know I've told you this before, but that really does inspire me and push me to want to be better. Like. I just watching you like get into Cinema 4D and wanted to learn that really like pushed me to do that myself. So I really do look up to you and yeah. I'm going to jump in too. Thanks, man. I think it's awesome just seeing like you guys together because our animation work is like a rocket ship inside a Rhino and it's really cool. Um, and I think you guys are, are an awesome combo because Jer is able to very driven to learn new things and bring new things into the into the mix and everything jerry brings the mix she and you're you're right there ready to go into and i think it's really cool to think about you know if you had taken a job somewhere that wasn't so aggressively pursuing new talents and new skills would you be learning cinema 4d and would you be growing as quickly and i just think you guys have a really awesome complimentary relationship um 
And uh, I'm just super thankful for your contribution, your contribution, and uh, all that good stuff. So anyway, I guess that wraps our little podcast episode two. Yeah. Uh, thanks, y'all. Thank you. Let's get to work. Yeah. Woo. Woo. Lego. Lego.